Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee with Trainer Road in Cannondale's Amber Pierce. Good morning. And Squid Bikes, Ivy Audrain. What up? Yeah. Do I have to add other ones to that? Or did I <laughs> no, nail it, it the first time? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I finally nailed it. Thanks for making it easy on me. And we also have our CEO, Nate Pearson. Uh, Trainer Road. Thank you. No, Trainer Road. Forgive me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Forgot yeah, my sponsor. Yeah. yeah. Nate, you should, man. It, what would be a good sponsor for Nate? We have Cannondale for Amber, Squid Bikes and Ivy. That's a good pairing. I feel like Ceramic What's, Speed is a great one for Nate. I was going to say the biggest mm. air fryer producer. <laughs> yeah, <be> ninja. <laughs> ninja. <laughs> uh, for those listening live, we understand there is a wind uh, leaf blower in the background, and hopefully that'll be knocked out in the uh, actual podcast. But uh, yep. Just- There's also uh, Ivy has like a construction convention, it seems like, going on outside <laughs> today. So bear with us if you hear some background noise. Just think of it as ambiance. I told them we had something really important to deal with. And I was like, hey guys, can you like get some donuts and come back later? They weren't into it though. So. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the city has bigger plans. I don't know, sorry. Uh, good stuff. Uh, if you're listening to this right now and you haven't tried Train Road, I don't know what's holding you up. You should give it a shot. Give it some prep for your events that are coming up. Go sign up. If you aren't satisfied within 30 days, we'll give your money back. We're happy to do so. That's the guarantee that's there. But go sign up. Go to trainerroad.com. Uh, we're also not doing the Ironman World Champs episode this week. We had a lack of diverse applicants to be on that podcast, meaning that we just had a bunch of dudes. So dudes, we love you, but we also love everybody. And if we just do a podcast with a bunch of dudes, I feel like we don't get a fair representation of what it is. Granted, I take ownership over this because I sent that out too late. If I had sent it out early enough, I bet that we would have gotten more applicants for that. So athletes, if you did or are going, you're probably listening to this right now and either going to or prepping for world champs, good luck, super excited. Looks like the wind isn't gonna be too bad, which is really great. Uh, and pace yourself because this course looks super tricky. So uh, good luck to everybody. We always have many, many athletes at Ironman world champs every year. So it's really exciting to, uh, to have it in St. George, a different location. Uh, okay, let's get into Clement's question. He says, can, and Clement, by the way, he's a frequent joiner of us here on the live chat on YouTube, and you can join us at Thursdays, 8 a.m. Pacific. So Clement, this is a great question, and thanks mm-hmm. for holding us to something here. He says, can you please define consistency? Everyone keeps talking about how consistency is key, but it's not explained in terms of what it actually is. Uh, is it training every day? Is it training every other day or a couple times a week, a year, two, or 10 consistently doing Z2 workouts or hard efforts or both? I could go on, but I think you get the point. Thanks so much. Um, it depends. Hmm. Who wants to take this? One? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nate. There well, yeah. Uh, well, I'm linking to our stuff live. No, I'll start. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. But what it is, it's so you can fall into the trap of thinking consistency means I'm going to work out every day right? Mm-hmm. That, that is not consistency, or I'm going to work out a certain way every day. And we know with, with periodization and uh, in, in which like a, a micro or meso or like the whole season cycle, your it needs to change. It needs to be a little bit more, a little bit less. And sometimes you need to take time off and you need to rest. Uh, and John, you want to mention what, like <laughs> about yeah. yesterday, last, you want to say that just For real sure. quick? It's funny. So I, uh, Nate, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. And Amber too, I know that you look at this, uh, you've probably looked at this stuff too in the product, but uh, polling data, and I'm using that in air quotes, is way more complex than it seems. Last week, I said that I was going to mention some data. We looked at it internally and I hadn't thoroughly vetted the context of it. And I don't think that it was the right thing to share this week with this discussion on consistency uh, because sharing one data point can imply a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And if you're not very clear, on what that data point is and the exact context of it, then it can throw things off. Looking further at it, it wasn't the right metric to share on here because it would have just led us into a rabbit hole of people thinking, well, shoot, I should never take a break year round. When really there's further context that needs to be identified and brought out in order to fully understand that data point mm. that we're talking about. It's it's really tricky, right, Nate? Like you can't just um, you can't just like pull data, snap your fingers, and it's like, yeah, perfect, here it is you have to really go through a lot of work to make sure that it's responsibly pulled data. I was going to say, it depends on how responsible you want to be. Cause I mean, honestly, we could show anything we want being irresponsible. And that happens a lot of times in just general, like, uh, you know, propaganda in the world that, uh, 
people have done is they just show it a certain way and make the X axis or I don't know. There's that's a side note, but yeah, we, had, uh, we just have to make sure our, we put the context around it, the details, cause all data is caveats, right? What is the source? What are we doing? Where is it coming from? And then what does it say? And what does it doesn't say? And we can't, it's really super hard to take any blanket statements with data. So going back to consistency, uh, what happens is, yeah, you, it's not just doing the same thing every day and it's not just working out every day, but I would say, uh, it is being, um, consistent in your thought process to training and being purposeful. So on your days off, which you should have days off, that is a air quotes training day. You're purposeful in training on your hard days, you're doing them. And on your easy days, you're doing them. And then when you feel like you're too tired, you take that day off. What can happen that creates inconsistency is one travel that can be really hard because you want to train, but you don't have access to it. We've talked about before some ways around that. Um, two is life gets in the way, right? You just get busy. You so want to train that day, but because you didn't prioritize it in your day, you miss it that day. And the next day you miss it. And then maybe you miss four days and you come back. And then what happens is over a season, you lose a lot of volume, a lot of air quotes consistency um, during that and you don't become as fast. And another thing that can happen is you go too hard. You go too hard on a workout. And then what happens after that is you uh, can't do your next workouts. You have to take more time off than you wanted to. Um, another thing is you might be um, eating not enough, right? And so you want to do this stuff and then by the you're not feeling enough and then you can't be as consistent. You get tired being sick. That can also do it. And these things hit everybody. But the, the way to do it is how can you how can you do it? better than you did before, right? There's no perfect. <clears throat> Nobody here is going to be perfect and don't strive for perfection. Just strive for, uh, better, right? Like it's, it's good. This is better than I did it before. And I feel good about this. And the biggest thing for consistency, I think, especially coming from me, this is my personal opinion is <clears throat> not doing too much too soon and holding back, staying at that eight, seven or eight, the whole season. Oh my, I've fallen this trap about a zillion times you get motivated. You, you know, you had a week of vacation and you're like, you know what, this is training camp week. We're going to, we're going to do uh, 15 hours. Uh, it, who cares? I only did six Manic. hours the, the previous weeks. Right. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, you get into this thought of like, I need to catch up. And, and then you get the yo-yo of you go harder than easy. And if you can just hold back a little bit, you know what you go, uh, today, 90 minutes sounds pretty good. You can use our little workout alternatives feature, go down to 115. Like you do that, what you're doing is your, your, um, your future self is going to be uh, so thankful that you did that because you'll be able to not push yourself over the edge. Um, so anyways, you go two ways, push yourself over the edge or you get too busy or actually push yourself over the edge too. You get unmotivated. That's another way. So prioritizing the day to make sure you can do these workouts, fuel your stuff, get your sleep. And then on the other side is don't do too much. And then that makes it so that over a season, you can do your workouts when you do need rest days. Some people. We've seen world champs, right? Three days a week. It is crazy. Like age group mm -hmm. world champs, not pro world champs. That's a whole different thing. And don't compare yeah. yourself to them. Right. It's not yeah. like, don't, yeah, that's another thing. Don't look at the, the world champions. Amber, you know this, right? Like us mortals can't handle like Amber. I did what? 30 hours of like training since you were like eight, yeah. uh, 30 <laughs> hours a week, like, like 20 to 30, literally. Right. Mm-hmm. How many hours were you like when you were 13, how many hours a week would you swim? Oh gosh, I don't remember exactly, but I mean, it would, it would vary between 20 to sometimes 40 hours of training a week. That wasn't always pool time, but that would include like dry line and weightlifting and things like that. So it was a lot. Was yeah. A lot. So what I'm saying is too consistently for you is not, don't compare yourself to somebody else. John can handle so much more volume than me. And when I tried to do John's volume, I was slower. When I reduced mm -hmm. my volume and took more rest, I was faster, which is crazy. I try to do yeah. 20, I do one 20 hour week, I'll be dead for a month. It, it crazy, <laughs> right? But Amber, she's done it since she was like a little kid and it's not that big of a deal for her. John too, huge backgrounds in sports, not as big of a deal. I, Ivy, how much volume can you handle a week? Um, Right now? the most is like 20 and 20. it's like so hard. I have to just stay on top of eating more food than I want to and sleeping more than I think I can. And it's, it's pushing it. 
what you're discussing right now is that edge, right? Where mm -hmm. if, if you make a mistake, that 20 makes it so probably the next week you do 10, right? Because you're like, I am burnt out. Ivy is a pro and has certain like uh, levels of mm, um, aspirations and stuff in a very competitive field. But I would say for most of us age groupers, especially people who want to like, you know, you're not in it to win a World Cup. Like if in that situation doing 12, 13, 14 hours a week, you will be, you'll end up faster one year later and you'll have more fun and you'll stay in the sport longer and everything, everything in life is better. Do you guys ever get that where you overtrain and like everyone is just a jerk? Like, it's just like a coincidence. <laughs> Are you having fun? Like, do you like Weird bikes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like with, um, uh, pandemic and lockdowns too, a lot of people found themselves having a lot more time to like suddenly jump into, you know, high volume and consistency is so contextual. Like if you've only been riding for a few years, you can't just start doing between 20 and 30 hour weeks just for the sake of consistency. And so I think it's important to say what consistency is not, and it's not refusing to allow yourself to take a rest day, um, or an off season or to be at low volume just for the sake of consistency. Like Nate said, it's not, it doesn't mean training every day or exercising every day or doing this big workload every single day and new athletes can fall into that trap and that can lead to fitness plateaus and burnout. Like Nate said, Sadness. we talked about, yeah, uh, we talked about a lot of different, uh, like specific examples of this, how it, it works in our own lives. Nate, if I could share like a unifying vision, a thing that at least helps me with this is I look at it and I think I get faster through the adaptation process. So I need to prioritize the adaptation process. And what I mean by that is when I train reasonably without blowing myself out and doing way too much, then I can recover and train the next day or train in two days, whatever my training plan has. And then that means that over the course of those four days, I'm going to be able to train, recover, adapt two different times. Whereas if I try to really train a bunch and blow myself out, I'm going to need a week or so to recover from that. And thereafter, I'm going to miss out on all these opportunities to be able to train, adapt. It's that dose response relationship. You dose your body with training, it responds by adapting to it. So one way to think of it is in your training, seek to find the like, uh, I guess like the, the appropriately tolerable dose of this adaptation process. If you can dose yourself with just enough and then you can adapt and then repeat and repeat and repeat, you actually probably are making more adaptations than training a bunch all at one go, like Nate said, and then having to have your training being thrown off from that. And I think that's why we see so many athletes do so well with low volume plans. Chad mentioned last week, allostatic load. And for a lot of us, your life, like just because you have the time doesn't mean that you can fill all of that with training. Your life may bring stress circumstances that simply don't allow you to recover effectively from a certain amount of training. So as a result, a low volume plan is a great spot to start. We sound like a broken record on this, but this is why, because you may be throwing water at an already saturated sponge, like you, mm -hmm. you can't take in more. So it, it isn't useful. And in the end, it actually ends up putting you further behind. And then on top of that, then you get frustrated because the training isn't working and you're doing more and it compounds. So, uh, as what saving Sarah Marshall do less, uh, that's like do less. That's a very important thing for us to learn as cyclists. And if we do less, then we can step up appropriately. <laughs> I was picturing that scene. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's, uh, what you said too, that those two days, some people, especially older athletes, you might need three. And I know our product doesn't do this right now, but I, uh, we have plans in the future, but I would say just push it out an extra day. It's fine. Uh, some people might need four. Another way that is perfectly fine to do it, which is coming relatively, not relatively soon, but you could do a low volume plan, use the workout alternatives. So, and choose a 90 minute or two hour ride. So this works really well for busy people is when you have your time, extending that one hour might not be so bad, but then you could take two days off and then do it again. And that gives you enough time to recover from that much. It, you don't have to do an hour on the low volume plan. It's think of more as like three days per week. And because we have uh, workout levels with adaptive training, when you use workout alternatives and you find that two hour workout, if it's the same number, like 4.5 threshold, it will be just as hard, right? And basically what happens is it, it takes into account the volume and the duration of intervals and, and all of that. And 
the shorter one will be a little more intense, but the uh, the you'll have more time and zone on that longer workout. And it, it's a really it's a it's a very valid and good way to train. And that's how I I was doing it for a long time because it is tough, right? It's tough to work out an hour, ninety minutes, six days a week um, mm -hmm. with with life and business and uh, kids and and all that sort of stuff and then eating everything we just talked about. So that yeah. is consistency too. You could do two hours, two days off, two hours, two days off, two hours, two days off, two hours, three days off. You could do an hour, three days off. All of those combos are right. It's what you want to find is what is the volume that I can hold myself, right? Long-term, mm -hmm. which I know I am so horrible at. There's different ways that we look at like the data that represents consistency. One of the other ways to look at it is missed workouts. Like if you're missing your scheduled workouts, then you're likely, unless you have a training plan, that's just, you've, you've picked, you've bit off more than you can chew in terms of volume. It's probably the case that you're not able to consistently progress through your plan, like is anticipated. And that also can really hold you back. So another way to look at this is, are you missing workouts with regularity? If that's the case, then you're probably missing key steps in your progressions along the way in your training. So it's probably best to step back your volume and enable yourself to be consistent and nail those workouts. I think if all of us sat back and thought about our training, we have this weird confirmation bias that uh, if we did well on a specific event, we'll look back and say, that's the exact reason why we were, we did well, or we'll look back and we'll just assume that a big training block or big rides absolutely had a big effect on us. But if we really were objective and looked back at it, when we were performing really well and our growth rate or our improvement rate was going up, chances are you were just like really consistent. Uh, maybe life was giving you uh, a, a pretty easy load to manage at the time. And you were able to just hit your workouts. You weren't doing a ton. You were just able to hit your workouts. So what we see by so many athletes when they come in and they train and they get fast in the winter because they're just hitting their workouts. It's simplified. They're using the indoor trainer. So it's easy and they don't have to worry about interruptions. And there's all these things that just remove roadblocks. And then when you can consistently hit your workouts, yeah, you get fast. It's what happens. Um, but certainly the load is something to, to keep in mind with it. So hopefully that answered your, your question, Clement, if I was to summarize, what is, Oh, Ivy, please. Go we, ahead. we should give our athletes some tools to help like self-assess if they think they're riding consistently. So like, are you missing workouts? Um, are you feeling like you have to cut your intervals short on more than a couple workouts a week? And just like checking in with yourself on how much you're sleeping, how fatigued you feel, like how motivated you are to do the workout. If all those things combined feel like it's not sustainable and you're missing, you know, workouts during the week consistently and cutting things short, um, time to look at your volume. Yeah, that's really key too. And so we have uh, progression levels, right? And that says what level you're at. And if you're doing a workout that's very close or it's achievable, let's say, let's say your level four threshold and your next workout is a 4.3 pretty small jump. It is hard. Um, lots of times you will come in with some sort of fatigue to a workout, right? There'll be, your legs will kind of hurt a little bit. You won't feel a hundred percent like you're tapered for a race. Don't expect that. But if you come into that workout and it is, you know, you haven't done in, well, I won't say this. So you do this workout and it's a 4.3 and you find that you can't finish it, right? It is, or it's an all out effort. It's really, really hard. Um, you have to turn an interval down. This is a sign that you're not recovered from the previous one because the actual amount of extra load isn't a big chump. This should be something that if you are recovered, you're, you know, you become less fit. And then in the recovery, you become more fit, right? Or your performance increases. That's a really good sign that something is happening and it could be a, just a extra day off thing, or it could be uh, a many week thing or many month thing about chronic fatigue, like creeping up, creeping up, creeping up, or it could be a work or life stress stuff or it could be motivation, or it could be nutrition, or it could be sleep, or it could be sickness, or it could be injury. That's why this stuff's hard, right? Mm -hmm. But basically the same answer is, next time I'm gonna give myself a little bit more rest between this, and then so I can try that workout again and finish it right. Um, very, very complex, the, the, the reason why it's happening, but the answer is the same, just have a little bit more space. I think there's a key distinction to make here, which is the difference between the plan and the execution. So what Ivy said about reassessing your volume, you need to make, if, if you're on the right plan for you, then consistency is about nailing those workouts and nailing that plan, adhering to that plan most of the time. 
Like it doesn't have to be a hard and fast. If you're nailing it 96% of the time, you're being consistent. But if you're only hitting 95, you're not being consistent. It's not that specific. If you're hitting most of your workouts well on your plan, you're good. And I know not everybody trains with a, an official training plan, but you can think of it in terms of your schedule. If you're scheduling workouts, you like to do three, hour, three workouts a week. If you are able to execute those workouts most of the time, and maybe a couple days a month you feel off, you need to take some rest, you need to skip a day because of a scheduling conflict, you're still being consistent. But the key is making sure that that baseline plan or schedule is appropriate for you. And then from there, the definition of consistency is, are you nailing it most of the time? So the execution is where the consistency comes, but in order to be consistent on executing a plan, the plan has to be the right plan for you. Um, or the schedule has to be the right schedule for you. So if you are scheduling six workouts a week for yourself and you find yourself missing two or three a week, like Ivy said, reassess what your plan is or what your schedule is. And that becomes kind of your target or your objective. And then as long as you're hitting that most of the time, you've probably found a good spot for yourself. Um, so think of it in terms of making sure that your, your schedule, your, your goals are appropriate. And then when you're hitting those most of the time, you're being consistent. For me, the biggest barrier to consistency and very well recapped Amber, by the way, nice job. Um, <laughs> for me, the, the barriers of consistency, and I want to share some actionable things that help me with this. One of the main ones is just things getting in the way of training. If I can get to the workout, I can typically do it, but it's things getting in the way. So for me, I have to simplify that prep my bottles beforehand in the morning, keep them in the fridge. They're ready to go. Have my shoes all by the bike, everything set. I'm ready to go. I have trainer road open and it's easy and I just jump right in. It remembers my devices. That way I don't have to worry about device issues. If I have all of those things laid out so that it reduces friction in between me and getting to that workout, another big one. And I know this seems obvious, but scheduling your training time on your personal calendar, that way that is time that you set apart for it. Uh, it, not everybody has the luxury to be able to just put it on my calendar and it's not interrupted and that's just is what it is, but you, we can try to do our best with it. The more effort we put into that, it means you'll have less effort that you need to put into just getting on and get doing your workout. It's a huge thing for me personally. On the other side, I see a lot of athletes question their training plan first or question their training volume when they aren't questioning things like nutrition and sleep which are two really big things. If you're not able to complete your workouts, I think Ivy already alluded to this, so I don't want to run in a circle, but really look at what you're doing to be able to enable yourself to train physically. And that's the nutrition side and that's the sleep side. So hopefully that's some actionable stuff that pairs with this answer to Clement uh, and everybody else listening. This is like advice that all of us, all four of us here need to hear. Obviously, mm -hmm. I think we all talked about how we weren't great at this, not perfect at this. That's why training is a struggle, right? So uh, anything else to add on this one before we move into Carson's question? All right, Carson says, I'm just a few races into my second season at Criterium Racing and now racing with the A and B grade fields instead of the C and D grade fields. Much like Nate's Cat 5 to Cat 2 in a year video, video series, go to youtube.com slash train road to check that out. Nice job, Nate. Uh, he says, I have a significant power advantage over most cyclists I was racing against in lower grade fields. So I relatively, in quotes, breezed uh, through the upgrade process, but now I'm stuck and can't seem to unlock how to win in these higher grade fields. Firstly, I was a mediocre rower in university for a few years, and I developed a big aerobic engine with the constant training and racing. I've always had a facility for shorter, shorter threshold efforts around eight to 12 minutes. And this carries to the bike. My ideal finish is a break when everybody else is not yet focusing on shuffling into position for the final or for the finish of the race. So I'm assuming that's somewhere around eight to 12 minutes to go is when this athlete likes to, when Carson likes to go. While this approach was effective in lower grades, I can't seem to break away from the field. Now, typical, re typical representation in the criteriums I've been racing is a mixed bag of a few small three to five person teams with strong riders, a couple big, but unorganized clubs and about 10 very strong riders that seem to all have a chance to win. I assume those 10 are like individual riders, not riders on a team. 
I used to do the Amber and Pete advised approach. I assume it sounds like Carson's watched our race analysis <laughs> of sitting in an efficient position in the back of the field, then taking advantage of momentum when the field slows to have a high speed differential when I reach the front of the field, discouraging them from following. This is a tactic that Nate has also uh, shown in his videos. It's one that works well for Nate too. When I do this now, it just seems to move me up to the front, but I can't get separation. Oh, that's the worst. Like you're planning this huge attack and then you just sit on the front pulling everybody instead of getting away. The most confusing part to me is that these riders are not following common advice of never being the one on the front doing the work. In fact, everybody seems to be happy to put in time pulling the field along at a pace that's fast enough to not let you rest, but not fast enough to have a meaningful impact on the field. So yes. why are they on the, <laughs> he says, so why are they? Uh, Nate's already getting in his last bit. Uh, so why are they on the front like that instead of strategically placing their efforts? Why does the momentum tactic not work? And how can I leverage my strengths against these higher, higher grade fields to start winning again? And if curious, Carson says, I have a 375 watt FTP at 86 kilograms. Nate, that sounds really similar to you at peak. I think that you except, were close to yeah, that. Yeah. Maybe at sea level, but yeah. that's strong. That was really strong. Yeah. And, and Carson also says our courses are mostly flat. So even though he's 86 kilograms, it's not like he's racing something like Tulsa tough on Crybaby Hill where it's like super mm -hmm. steep and punchy. Hey, I want to go before Amber because she'll have the right answer. And I want to know if I'm the right answer. So <laughs> basically, so that eight to 10 minute break, and that's like a few laps to go. Probably mm -hmm. the issue is when you get to these higher categories, people work as a team. And when you try to do it eight or 10 minutes solo, it is so easy for two, even two riders to do like a two, two minute efforts and then you're back again. And they're not just going to let you go because people are going to work as a team with a sprinter. Even if it's a team of three people, this is very possible. And then like a uh, NorCal, like a, a one, two or a master's one, two, that happens all the time. The only way that this works is if you're in a breakaway with representation from the other teams, that might be your jam because then you could break from that group. But if you try to break from the Peloton, they will chase you. Um, another thing that you could, well, actually, I'll, I'll save my stuff. Uh, Amber? Amber. <laughs> I actually want to hear from <laughs> Ivy on this one because cool. Ivy actually has notes in here, which I think she nails it. So I, I think Ivy needs to jump in. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Uh, I loved reading this question and I, it felt kind of mean, but I was like, welcome, Carson. Like, welcome <laughs> to the migration experience of not being able to just roll off the front all the time. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> But this town sounds totally right. Um, they're having to catch up on the soft skills of maneuvering through a field that they didn't have to when they were so much stronger than everyone and just got to roll off the front. Um, so this is totally normal. It's it's not an unheard of or like unusual experience. Um, it's just this is the time for you to catch up on that stuff that you didn't have to before because you were so much stronger than everyone. Um, so the biggest takeaway from Carson's question of why are they pulling a field along at a pace that's fast enough to not let you rest, but not fast enough to have a meaningful impact on the field. They're controlling a race. Those people doing that are on the front because they're trying to control the race for some reason, or they're doing it on purpose because of how many laps to go. They're like trying to be first to a corner. Everything that they're doing is for a reason. Um, and because you're not able to su successfully attack in that environment when they're on the front like that, um, it's for a reason. And so this is, um, you know, this is the time for Carson to um, learn who is doing what successfully and just try to learn from those riders and see what they're doing um, because ultimately they're, they're beating you. So even if it doesn't make sense that they're sitting on the front at certain times and burning a match when, when you don't understand why they are, there's a reason for it. And so Carson should enjoy this time in their career where they get to learn. And, um, those skills are super valuable long-term and will lead to more enjoyment in bike racing later. Um, when you get to, when you get to learn these skills and it's more fun to be, tricky and sneaky and those things are so rewarding when you get it right um that even if you don't win you get to come away with something super enjoyable from a bike race when you nail that mm -hmm. stuff they're so keep doing it carson. they're doing it to make it so you can't attack carson yes that's why they're doing it mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's uh and you you'll see riders yelling at other riders why are you doing tempo on the front and the only reason those riders are yelling at the ones doing tempo on the front is because it's frustrating 
-hmm. when the field's going 21 miles an hour, for example, and, and forgive me, those that don't use uh, imperial system here, I'm going to use miles per hour because it's relevant and familiar for me. But if you're That's rolling 21, thanks, Nate. So if you're rolling 33K or 21 miles an hour, an attack that you lay down, if you're coming from the back of the field, is going to really sting that field because you might be able to get up to like 29, 30 miles an hour, maybe even more by the time you get to the front of that field. Oof, that's discouraging. It's funny how just changing that up to 23 miles an hour, maybe up to 24 to 25, somewhere in that range, your attacks sting a lot less. It's way easier to be able to then catch up to you and just never let you go. By the time the riders call out that there's a rider coming up on the left, they've already increased two miles an hour and suddenly the sting is completely gone from your attack. It's a tactic. Mm -hmm. I've used this tactic absolutely when I'm like, boy, I went hard there, but if I ease up too much right now, then they're going to attack me and it's going to hurt me really bad. So if I'm in a spot where I'm hurting or I don't want people to attack me, yeah, I will encourage riding tempo on the front to stop people like Carson from breaking away. It just takes away the sting. It's that simple. Amber, what you've dealt with teams doing all sorts of masterful tactics <laughs> in a bunch of different circumstances. What would you say to Carson in this case? He has this strong eight to 12 minute power. He has savvy riders that are controlling the field, like Ivy said. What would be the way for him to win? Do you see one or do you just have actionable tips for him to help him learn? Oh yeah, definitely um, both. <laughs> so first of all, <laughs> I think both Nate and Ivy nailed it. Um, absolutely right. And I think that one thing I've noticed over the years with athletes who are, <laughs> yeah, um, oh, wait, they just way. internet, internet zone, they zoom five I, each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Things you miss if you don't join in on YouTube. I know. Right. <laughs> um, so when you're getting started in racing and you're racing in the lower categories, categories with you usually have less experienced riders and you'll also have a much broader range of fitness levels and experience levels. So there is a lot more room to make mistakes, um, to play around and to be a little bit less ruthless and surgical with your tactic, <laughs> tactical execution. Um, and one of the things that you can get away with in the lower categories is saying, okay, my strength is eight to 10 minutes at threshold. So I'm going to attack eight to 10 minutes before the, the finish that doesn't fly in the upper categories In the upper categories, you have to actually really think more closely and focus more closely on what is the terrain? What is the wind? What are the dynamics within the field? Who am I racing against? So you're, you're less racing. You still have to play to your own strengths, but now you really have to figure out how are you going to play that against what's actually happening in the race? Um, and this is exactly what's happening. You're trying the same thing as you did before with no success, because as Ivy mentioned, and as Jonathan mentioned, and Nate, th the overall speed of the field is faster. So instead of looking for the opportunity to attack eight minutes before the finish, now you have to think, okay, how do I attack when the dynamics of the field are going to present an opportunity for me to get away? It's a very different way of thinking about the race. And in this case, the higher the level you get to, honestly, you have to attack when it's harder. So in a lower level category, when the field bunches up, that only happens when the speed comes down and that bunch up allows you to come from the back to the front with some, some momentum. And you can sometimes catch people off guard because by the time you enter their peripheral vision, you're already going a lot faster than they are. And you have that speed differential. You're not going to catch people off guard in the upper categories like that. It's just not going to happen. What will happen is if the field bunches up like that, which it rarely does at those upper levels, people will be expecting attack. You won't, they will be expecting an attack. You won't catch them off guard and they'll just be that much more rested because it just slowed down. When you, um, in the upper categories, in order to get away in a breakaway, you have to attack when people can't or won't follow you, follow you. And the ways that, that happens is they're too gassed to follow you or there's a physical barrier to them being able to follow you, maybe through a really narrow chicane or something like that. Um, so it gets harder because now instead of attacking when the field has slowed down, you're better off attacking when the field has sped up. And what I mean by that is not when somebody's riding tempo on the front, but let someone else try to attack that tempo, get a wait till somebody else is attacking. And then you don't be the first one to go. You follow those attacks with everybody else after two or three of those counters and everybody's super gassed, including you, by the way, 
-hmm. That's when you know it's a good time to go. When you are hating life and you're like, this sucks, I hope no one else goes, that's when someone's gonna get away. And if you can be the person that says, oh wow, I am hurting so bad right now, everyone else must be hurting. If I dig just a little bit deeper and I really commit to an attack right now, I can probably break the elastic. That's when you can make it happen. And it is really hard to do mentally and it's really hard to execute on physically, but that is a way that you can try to get away. And as Nate mentioned, when you have team dynamics in here, it's not just about your power and it's not just about how well you execute that attack. It's about tactically who comes with you and tactically who's gonna have an interest in chasing you behind you. So those are all things. So every time you try to initiate a breakaway, you're rolling the dice to see what the composition of that breakaway is. If that's gonna be tactically advantageous to you, to the folks in the break, great. If not, you might have to go back to the field and roll the dice again later. It is not easy, but like Ivy said, this is a super fun learning curve. It is really fun to get out there and try this stuff. Carson, what I uh, would say based on what Amber's comments are, for your power, I would win from a breakaway. That's probably, because you didn't mention sprinting, right? That's probably the only way, because you're not gonna solo probably in an, in an uh, A category uh, at the end when there's other teams. And instead of being the one that causes the breakaway uh, or that starts the breakaway, I would follow somebody. It's always easier, I think, to follow somebody. And like, let the team, this is what I've seen, just to what Amber said too. The best teams, the first breakaway, like doesn't ever work. And, but everyone has to chase. It's almost like soften people up. So I see teams do like one, two, they send two people and they might send those two people again. And then there's like a third rider that's been sitting there the whole time that goes and that person really goes. And then like two other people from two other teams goes and the whole field goes, oh, I'm so gassed, I can't do it. If you can be with that group and then, especially if they're, the people know each other, that is when it might slow down at the end. People start looking at each other. That's when you do these tactics where you're in the back. They look at each other just for a second and you go. And then they have to look at each other for one more second, right? Who's going to follow this person? And because you're 375, that, that is likely to solo because they are not going to probably work together if there's two, three riders to catch you unless they really know who you are. Um, like if you're not considered the best and you're coming up in a category, it's so much easier for them to look at each other because they know if they pull this other person, this other person is going to win. So they want them to pull. But now it's now it's three seconds. Now it's four seconds. And you got a big engine. Like get low and just pedal as hard as you can. That's the way that I would win is just follow, work on following other breakaways, but I wouldn't even do it until halfway through the race. Uh, unless there's some kind of course that the first break always goes. Uh, yeah. I would, um, I want to follow up on that because I think that's a really good point. And going back to that point of the composition of the break being really important, use the early part of the race to watch if there are teams that are working together as teams, which is a big if, but let's assume there are, if they are there, you watch what they're doing in the early part of the race and you will find out very quickly which team is actually interested in getting a breakaway and which isn't. And the team that's interested in a breakaway is not the team that's necessarily attacking. You'll see teams go on the attack and then not work the breakaway. Those are teams that are just trying to soften up the field for a field sprint. You look for the teams that are actually sending somebody up the road who is then pulling through or at least rolling through the break with whoever is with them. Those are the teams that are interested in a breakaway. So then you keep an eye on all of those jerseys and you watch for those teammates to go later in the race. Like Nate said, it's not necessarily going to be the first one. They're not going to send their strongest rider on the first early breakaway. They're going to wait. And then they're going to send their strongest rider when they're really ready to commit to it. So look for those signs early on in the race. Yeah. Jonathan. With that power profile, Carson, that field's going to begin to fear you if you become wise with tactics, because Nate mentioned the breakaway. If I'm picking like an ideal rider in a criterium to break away, it's a rider that has really good somewhere around eight to 12 minute power, because with a breakaway, remember, it's not that you push extremely hard for the rest of the race. It's that you put, you're able to push hard enough to get a gap and then control that gap thereafter. That's a very important thing to understand. It's you can ride slower than the field strategically later on in a breakaway and it's okay. They can catch up a little bit. It's fine. What you're trying to do is just discourage them from thinking about bridging to you. And if they can't bridge to you, then they are not, or if they think they can't, they won't do it. So in your case, if you have really strong eight to 12 minute power, that's the sort of thing that over the course of three laps, you can get that sort of gap that puts you out of sight and discourages people from going up to you and thinking, okay, 
Now I'm going to reshift my tactics and race for second or race for a field sprint instead of racing for the win up with this breakaway. So I think that you actually have it right now, like Amber said, you're just placing your skills in the wrong circumstances to be successful. Instead, mm-hmm. it's placing them, like Nate said, in the breakaway to be successful. The, the last thing I want to mention with this is that uh, when a field, Amber mentioned that you need to attack when, when you feel tired because everybody else is probably feeling tired. And that's the time when you have the best chance at breaking people's will. Right. And that's mm-hmm. absolutely the case. One thing I want to mention with that too, is that if you set out to race intelligently with this, don't think that just because you're tired that you don't have a chance to make this work. Cause that's absolutely something that your brain yeah. will put into place. <laughs> just make sure you race intelligently and racing intelligently might mean that you're completely gassed still. Like mm-hmm. sometimes that happens because the field's just really strong. So it, w- like, I just want to kind of contextualize what that feels like. It doesn't mean that you can just race, uh, in, in a, in a careless manner and that you can just attack, attack, attack. Now I feel tired. So now I'm going to go. It's best to really roll with the punches with the field. And then when you feel tired and you've been matching the field, then you have a clear indication that the field is probably feeling what you feel. If you just race aggressively, like I do oftentimes and just attack yourself and counterattack yourself, well, then you're going to be tired, but that doesn't mean that it's the right time to attack. Make sure that you have a close proxy to the field's feeling as well as your own. And that if those match, then you have a clear indication of where you're at. And also, also takes time to learn. <clears throat> oh, sorry. It, mm-hmm. it doesn't. Yeah. Don't be afraid to roll tempo on the front. I know that this sounds like a, a grave, like, like one of the cardinal sins to avoid, like just never be on the front, always keep your nose clean. But let's say you do get yourself where you've bit off a bit more than you can chew. You've raced a bit more aggressively than you should have. In that case, you're vulnerable to an attack and maybe your fatigue is higher than the rest of the fields. If that is the case, maybe it's time for you to just roll in with a few of those riders that are rolling tempo on the front. And maybe it's time to sit there. It's a gamble you have to take, but if you can roll tempo and recover a little bit on the front, that might discourage people from throwing a really hard attack when you've dropped all the way to the back of the field to try to get the most draft possible. It's a gamble though. I know Nate probably see, and, but I wonder if it's differences in physiology because I'm going to disagree though, too. Well, this is something that you, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Because this is something that we see absolutely work at totally different levels of racing, high and medium and low levels of racing. So you never want to be the only one that's rolling tempo at the front. So if you're an individual and you don't have a team with you, if you ever want to be rolling tempo at the front, you need people working with you. If there are other people that are willing to ride tempo at the front, you don't need to ride tempo at the front. No, you just, just slot in. That's what I, no, like, my, and that'll be even less. Is, yeah. Unless it's like you and one other person are the only two that want to ride tempo at the front and you get that person to work with you. But if there are even two other people that are rolling tempo at the front and they're willing to do that because they want to accomplish what Jonathan's describing, slot in right behind them. You know, you don't have to be in that rotation. You can benefit from the work that they're willing to do and they're willingly making that choice and you get to benefit from the same outcome without having to do the work. But that takes a lot of savvy. That takes being in a really good position. And it takes some patience and playing a little bit of poker there. Well, the huge stipulation there is that you have people that are already pulling and rotating on the front. And that's right. like, that's if that exists. If that doesn't exist, which absolutely could be the case if the field's been softened up enough, then you have to make that choice. And it's really what you're most, most vulnerable to right? If you are vulnerable to a big attack going in that moment, and that might absolutely split you out or spit you out of the back of the field, then you have to make the decision of whether it's, whether you can recover at a relatively decent pace. All depends. Like, sure. If there's someone in front of you sitting there draft, but if not, then you have to think about the best ways to be able to work with your strengths. Uh, You're never going to be able to like tire the field out by yourself. No, if there's like a four rider, like, or three riders, I've seen that where someone just keeps breaking and everyone else has to go, but there, there's no way for you to like tire out the field. Um, so <clears throat> don't think that your breaks are like, Oh, I'm just tiring them out over and over and over again. This happened in our first cat three. John's like, Oh, I made it feel so tired. Right. And you had like a 300 watt NP for like 20 minutes in mine. And in that race, it, this is different than yeah. you weren't tired because you were sitting in. 
but look at how few people were able actually to follow the move at the end and able to actually go with you. I think it was two or three people tried because I'm super it. strong, but I, but that's why this is totally, <laughs> it's totally different though, because it's dealing with, we're talking about different fields. See if, if Carson's racing in the lower field, I bet this works just fine. And there may be mm -hmm. people in that situation, yeah. uh, I'm but sure in these tired. fields where it's harder then it's different. You tired some people out, but his, his NP was 300 or more. And mine was 220. And mm -hmm. that's just because I was surfing inside. And because it was such a big field and it would, it'd be bunched to elastic. I could, like John said, I, I'd float back. And then, uh, when it slowed down, I'd float up and I'd float back. And I didn't have the accelerations that everybody else had. And that really, you know, allowed me as a bigger rider to do a big hit at the end. Uh, but uh, John too, what tired people out is your big hit at the end. Cause it was strung out and it was positioning. And we went into a chicane. It was like all those things together, John at the end. Um, it's no, that's the one that camera went out the end of it, but well, we have some video, yeah. Yeah. um, John strung it out. So therefore positioning as Amber said, people couldn't get around. We're going really fast. And then we went into a chicane, uh, and then it was so strung out. I think there was a crosswind too, that then I mm -hmm. could go. And so with that crosswind, people couldn't get a draft in anybody. It's strung out. So for someone to catch me, they got to come up like six extra riders, right? Or four extra in riders wind. in the wind, right? And I think the person mm -hmm. behind me too, if I remember this correctly, he was very strong. He's over five watts per kilo, but he was also like 130 pounds. And that was the perfect rider to have on my wheel because there's a crosswind and I have a very strong, but uh, not huge FTP rider. So then he gapped which was the best situation for me, right? To have someone like that. If I had Carson on my wheel, Carson probably wouldn't, it wouldn't have, I wouldn't have gone because Carson would be able to have some sort of draft to the side of me and, and stay on. But all of those things lined up that made it really, really good at the end. And yeah, the, the race was hard and there were attacks and stuff, but I'm just saying John alone could not make the whole field tired for John to win. John Correct. can make the field tired yeah. to help a teammate win, but not himself. Yeah, that's the key difference there. Like there were probably six riders that I had marked as in like, these riders could win, these riders could win. And they wanted to win so badly, they just kept following all my attacks. I'm the sacrificial lamb. Like, you know, I'm not going to sprint at the end, but I'm I'm going hard enough so that they know that I can win. And then they just get completely blown up by trying to follow all of my moves while you were just letting yourself slide through the yo-yo, you know? And John was easier. like, I want to work out this race. He goes, I just going to work out. And what's yeah. awesome on the podcast too, at that time, uh, John is a strong rider, but everyone was like, John, 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 John. And the That's first, so uh, <laughs> yeah, the, I remember putting my shoes on before the race and someone's like, if you get dropped, don't worry. It's not a big deal. Like first cat three. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. And then he actually afterwards said, I thought you did get dropped and then you won, which was awesome. That's the best, right? You don't mm -hmm. Amber Ivy. How often does that happen? You don't see the person who wins until the very, very end of the race, because they've been sitting in the whole time. How often does the person who wins in the upper categories, where you see them the whole time being active the entire race? In the upper never. categories? Never. Yeah. I can't never. think of a single time I've seen that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I do want to follow up one thing. Um, Carson, you're viewing yourself as a threshold writer, and you're very much zeroing on the strength of being the eight to 10 minute threshold writer. I really want to encourage you to train your sprint. And the reason for that is you're not going to be able to use momentum alone to initiate a breakaway in the upper categories. You just won't. So even if you don't anticipate becoming a pure sprinter, you need to work on your sprint because you have to have a snap in order to initiate, in order to create a gap to get a breakaway going. And even if you're not the person who's creating that gap, you may need to bridge. You may need to match somebody else's acceleration. But the people who are going to make a breakaway happen are going to have a very good acceleration. And you have to when you're trying to get away from a field that's moving a lot faster than you're used to. So I strongly encourage you to start letting go of that identity a little bit and exploring other strengths and training other strengths because having a really good acceleration is a super important tool if you want to be a breakaway rider. Yeah, yeah it's almost being... it's like the T right? It, it, teeing up your skill. If you can, mm -hmm. if you just try to rely on it and roll threshold right from the, okay, now I engage my threshold pull. Well, that's going to be really easy. You have to tee right. yourself up for success. And even in a breakaway of like four people going to the end, because you're FTP, you'll probably be fresher than them. And if you have any kind of pop, like 
Mm-hmm. You can you can sit in and stay on someone's wheel and then pop around them. Uh, being a similar size of you, if you can do, mm, so I was spinning around like 1200 or even 1100 sometimes at the end of a race. If you, in training, if you could do like three seconds or five seconds between 14 and 1500, that's with your other power profile and then being fresh at the end so it doesn't degrade as much as other people, I bet mm-hmm. you'll win so many races if, as long as you're savvy, like so many. Carson, the state of you as a bike racer and athlete is so fluid right now. This is sick. Yes. like, I'm so excited for them. They get to go learn all this stuff and learn from the people they're racing with and figure out how to capitalize on their strengths and what they are. Don't put yourself in a box right now. Like this is so tight that you get to do all this and just lean into the process of learning what you can do and who you are as a bike racer is going to be tight. Yes. Well said. Uh, Bill's question. He says, does the amount of kilojoules in a ride equal the amount of kilocalories burned regardless of the rider? We actually answered a question similar to this, but I thought that this was a fantastic uh, way to phrase it. In other words, if Filippo Ghana with a massive FTP rides 500 kilojoules and I did 500 kilojoules, did we burn the same amount of energy? If it was the same wattage, like 200, or he says, if it was at the same wattage, like 200 Watts. Um, then he says, it would seem like the same wattage would be much easier for Ghana than it would be for me. So key thing, he's bringing effort into this, into his calorie burn here instead of work. But he says, it would seem like the same wattage would be much easier for Ghana than it would be for me, resulting to me burning more calories than him since I'm working harder. Even if we're expand or expending the same KJs in the same amount of time in the same wattage. Thanks. Hope this makes sense. Nate. Yeah, this is, this is key. So we're talking about physics, right? So it doesn't matter what the revs of the engines are. It is, and I'm going to make a big caveat here and we'll go back to it about efficiency, but this much energy makes you go this fast with this other kind of, uh, with these constrictions of rolling resistance, wind resistance, uh, acceleration, stuff like that. So it is exactly the same, uh, for that amount of work going in. And that's measured by the amount of, uh, calories, which is Watts over time, uh, kilojoules. I'm sorry. The conversion from kilojoules to cal- calories, they're a one to one in our software because we're assuming an efficiency at B of 24%. Now, people can have different efficiencies. And <clears throat> some world class riders have a lower VO2 max, but they have a higher efficiency. But to measure your fit- efficiency, you have to go into a lab and, like, it's, it's, it's crazy. We can't do it ourselves. We don't know what your efficiency is. So we pick that 24 somewhere in the range. So when, you, when we say you're, you burned, I don't know, 300 calories in a ride, it could be more or less than that. And if you're using that to maintain weight, what you want to do is think of, I mean, honestly, measuring your calories too, is like never perfect is very hard to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you just say, okay, I'm doing this. And am I losing weight or gaining weight depending on what your goal is? And then you can adjust because it should be consistent over time and you might improve efficiency. Um, but it's not going to be these huge jumps at a time. Like it won't go from 22% 22% to 27% in like a week. It's going to be incremental over time as your body gets more of that. But yeah, it is the exact same uh, kilojoules that you burn as somebody else, assuming you have the same efficiency, which is super interesting um, and fun. But that's, you think of yourself like a little engine, right? Like how much power or like a the math equation that you would do in high school, how much power this way and this way, that's what it is. Doesn't yeah. care how, what the, how hard it feels to you. Outside of efficiency, you're doing the same work. So then as a result, mm-hmm. it's the same. Like effort, uh, effort really doesn't matter <laughs> when it comes to calories burned. That's the cool part about training more and getting more fit is it allows you to do more work and work has to come from somewhere. So we measure that work in terms of calories and that's, you know, it's coming from different stores that we have in our body. So as you get more fit, you can just do more. I do wonder though, it's gotta get, and sorry, I know that. So Bill, hopefully this answer your question. It's the same for both of you. Um, even mm-hmm. if it feels harder for you, but this, there is gotta be like a double-edged sword. Amber, did you ever notice this having like a relatively higher FTP than the racers that you were racing with? Maybe even protecting like the tiny climbers, like where you just had to eat more than them and you had to take in more calories because that's a real downside to this, where if you burn more, you also have to take in more. And if it, it can kind of get to a point of diminishing returns, I'm not sure if you ever got to that point though. I wouldn't call it a downside though. I think that was pretty rad. <laughs> <laughs> if you're Filippo Ghana and you're like a over 500 watt FTP, 
that's hard, like hard to fuel that work. Like if he's just riding there at tempo versus me riding at tempo, boy, he's like, he's, he's got to really take down a ton of fuels. It it does depend, Mm. but this is a very real thing. Like the, the fitter you get, the more, the higher your capacity to do work and burn. I mean, doing work is burning energy, right? And calories, KJs, it's all energy. So if you're able to expend more energy because your body is fitter, you need more fuel to cover that energy expenditure. And I think that was actually one of the things that was harder. I'm a bigger rider. I have a bigger FTP. I am, you know, doing a lot of work. And so I probably do need to eat more than relatively speaking than somebody who is smaller with a lower FTP than me. Um, and honestly, like in the pro ranks, that was really hard because there was this not super healthy, like, uh, surveillance, I will say of team meals sometimes where it was like, I'd be loading my plate up because I know that I need it right for exactly the reasons that you're, you're describing. And so my plate's going to look a lot different from somebody's plate next to me. And sometimes that was a little challenging because I was feeling a little bit judged about that, but the very, I mean, the very just basic truth of the matter is yeah, sometimes you need more and not everybody needs the same things and you need to figure out what works for you and what you need and, and honor that honor it. No matter what, what else, no matter what anybody else is saying, uh, we normalize uh, not comparing ourselves to world tour writers ever yes. again yeah. at all. Yes. Like, just don't look at that. Just don't look at it. Yeah, right. Go but, ahead, but I'm going to do it right now. Uh, so the, <laughs> the difference is, is when you're, uh, when you have a very high FTP, so it's same with calories, but where you get that energy from your body is different. And if you do have a 500 watt threshold, you're running at 200, that's going to be mostly fat, right? It's like, it's like the all day energy that you can go where if your FTP is 200, it's going to be mostly glycogen and you're not going to be able to last, uh, not mostly it's, it's a lot more, uh, you're not gonna be able to last as long. So in the case that you are a 500 watt rider in the nice part is that your aerodynamic drag usually isn't linear with your FTP or your size. So it might just be a little bit more, although the drag is exponential, but basically if you have a, a bigger threshold at the same speed, you're probably on a flat road. You're probably exercising at a lower percentage of threshold therefore not using as much glycogen, therefore not needing to fuel as much relative or not losing as much because in these hard races, you're probably, it's just a attrition, right? You, you lose over time rather than gain over time. And those things combined on a flat road makes it a big advantage for the, the, the larger rider. Now, if there's accelerations or going uphill, it's different, but flat high speed, I think you're advantage, bigger rider for eating. And that's not really typically how they use Filippo Ghana in races though. <laughs> so they want him at the front rolling high speed and he does it for a long time. Tony Martin was a good example of this after he was such a good time trialist. And then after that, he was just the super domestique and he would ride at the front of the field at extremely high amounts of power and just tow them along at a really high pace for a long time. Like it, it's, but- it's something that a lot of athletes. So this is circling back to what Amber said there's this pressure we have to starve ourselves and to not fuel the work. And that absolutely exists. And if you're a larger rider, you have greater pressure on you. Social societal pressure to do that. I think, I think that's just a reality and it sucks, but I think it's there. So then you get into a situation where you're, you're, you have a higher amount of power than the riders that you know, ride with anything else. And you may fall into a trap of undernourishing just because you aren't appreciating how much work you are doing when you go out for a ride. I'm not saying that when you're riding at the same, at a slow pace with a bunch of riders, but just when you go out riding, you're just doing more work than mm-hmm. what a lot of other riders are. As a result, you need to feel the work. Yeah. So it's an important thing to keep in mind. Like uh, we talked about, yes, if you and another high FTP rider ride at the same exact wattage, yes, it's the same relatively speaking, but then if you're just going out and training, Tempo for you burns more calories than tempo. Like tempo for Nate burns more calories than tempo for me because that's mm-hmm. uh, his higher wattage. Higher. Yep. It's higher, higher wattage. Well, maybe not anymore. Uh, <laughs> well, so Ghana's is doing that too, to stop Carson's, right? Exactly that is why right. he's yep. riding at like 27, 28 miles per hour is stop Carson's from attacking. Uh, yep. Exactly. All circles back. <laughs> 
Yeah. Ivy, do you have anything else to add on that? Nope. Good job, y'all. Cool. <laughs> <Crushed>. <laughs> Thanks, Ivy. Uh, <laughs> Calvin says, and by the way, if you're joining us in the YouTube uh, chat right now, give the video a thumbs up. There's lots of you in there. Give it all a thumbs up. Then that way it will get to more cyclists. Uh, and if you're listening on whatever podcast app, rate this podcast five stars. That is a huge help for us. I'm going to check before the end of the episode where our ratings are at relative to other cycling podcasts. We need to be number one. Help us be number one. Okay. Calvin says, thanks as always for your awesome advice. I noticed a trend in my energy levels and mood when I'm off the bike, depending on what training block I'm in. And was curious as to whether there's any deeper science to this. Specifically when I'm in a base phase, I find that I'm generally more spry and energetic from the moment I wake up in the mornings, but when I'm in a build or specialty phase or racing a lot, anything where I'm going over threshold frequently, I wake up and spend much of the day feeling more lethargic. This usually goes away once I ride. So I guess you could say that in these higher intensity phases, my body requires a bike ride to fully wake up, which is not the worst thing in the world. <laughs> Is this a common trend and is there any deeper physiology behind this, perhaps relating to increased levels of lactate in the body or something behind just intense efforts, making you feel tired? If so, anything I could be doing differently to feel a little more energy while in build and specialty phases. Caffeine. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, Amber, uh, uh, this, this isn't like. So in this case, Calvin, you're not alone, right, Amber? Mm -hmm. Like this is yeah. this is something that all of us experience. Yeah, and I don't have the deeper physiology behind this, so I want to make that caveat very clear <laughs> off the top. Um, but this is definitely something where I think most folks feel different in different phases, right? The effect of the type of stress that you're applying to your body in each phase is different, and it's going to elicit different sensations for everybody and how it affects one person might be different for another. Um, so a lot of this is the old, the old chestnut of it depends. Um, but absolutely. I think most of us probably feel different depending on what we're focusing on in training. And I absolutely felt different when I was in the middle of race season than I did when I was in, you know, season prep mode. Um, and a lot of that has, you know, we'll go back to anything that's connected with mood. You definitely want to look into your fueling. That's a huge, huge thing, um, especially when you're going over threshold. That usually means that the work you're doing might be more than what you're used to in an endurance base phase. Um, so I would, I would think about, you know, are you adjusting your nutrition according to the work that you're doing? So the nutrition during your base phase might look different than what it is during your build phase or your specialty phase. Um, and then same goes for everything else that's touches recovery. Um, your recovery needs to look different during build and specialty than it does during base phase. So are you accounting for those things? And that might have something to do with it too. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to say Calvin. Smiling and, oh, oh, yeah, sorry. I was laughing because I just finished um, a really big block of training in NorCal. And I remember towards the end of it feeling really tired and like sad. And I literally thought to myself, I feel like everyone around me is really annoyed with me. Oh, I should probably just eat something. And then it got better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's magic. Yeah. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Calvin, this goes back to our previous question is this is a sign you're on that edge. And some of those days you say, sometimes it feels better and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so when it does feel better, you're still on that edge. And when it doesn't, you've gone over the edge. So this might be a sign depending on how often you go over that edge, that you might need to back off the intensity volume or increase the sleep and nutrition or a combination of both. That's, that's as simple as it is. And as Amber said, listen to the sensations in your body. Um, <laughs> some people, but if you always feel kind of like, mm, I know I'm going to feel like junk for the first 15 minutes, but then you always feel better afterwards. And that happens time and time again, and you keep getting faster. Don't worry about it. But it, if it doesn't go away, and you don't want to train, like the motivation starts going down, you start, start not finishing workouts, back it off a little bit or increase the food and sleep um, or both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, just one last thing on the, on the recovery part too, as you go into these longer or these phases, maybe you're working in more group rides, unstructured rides, and maybe what you're doing is you're not sacrificing any one of your workouts and you're just adding on that stress of the group rides. Life also just gets a bit more busy, usually as we get to warmer weather in the Northern hemisphere around this time of year, <clears throat> maybe you've got more engagements with kids or with work or with uh, friends, anything else like that. 
and that's adding up to it. Remember, you can't just operate, you keep your training in a vacuum. It's a part of your life and your life is constantly changing. Uh, Nate's mentioned this on the podcast now, and he had a period of time when trainer road was first launching where he was just full gas on trainer road and time off of training. Then he had a time where he really focused on training these days. He's focusing more on trainer road, your life ebbs and flows. And if you just try to keep your training perfectly consistent and, and keep it in a vacuum from everything else that gets tough. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's really great to be able to drop down to a low volume plan. Heck, if you can't even do that, maybe train now is a great option too, uh, because then you can just fit in structure when you can. Uh, so I don't want to take you off your plan, Calvin, but I'm more thinking about other athletes listening to this that may be in a similar situation. Uh, and in that case, it's good to be able to know that you have different levels of adjustment that you can make to your training. And of course, adaptive training, if you're answering those surveys effect, like appropriately, uh, which really, once again, they just say, how did that workout feel? And that's all you're trying to answer. Don't overthink it. Mm -hmm. Even though us cyclists tend to just trying to answer how it felt. And if you're doing that appropriately, it's going to make the right adjustments to your training too. So, okay. Brandon's question. He has two of them. He says, I've been using train row for a couple of months now, and I'm happy with it. I have two unrelated questions which are listed below. First of all, thanks, Brandon. Go to trainerroad.com and sign up if you haven't. Be like Brandon. Uh, he says erg mode versus standard mode. In the podcast a few weeks back, Jonathan mentioned that he always uses standard mode rather than erg mode. I understand the difference between the two, but can you speak to any particular advantages and why you choose to train this way? Honestly, there's no advantage. And if anything, I think there's probably a disadvantage potential for training in standard mode because if you don't hold your targets you know, well, then obviously you're not holding your targets well. Uh, I can hold my targets just well, and I like it. It keeps me engaged. I, I like that. It's just a personal preference, but he says, uh, and then let's go into his next question. He says, I really like the concepts of adaptive training and AI FTP detection. I think these will continue to get better and better as well. I've been on a low volume plan and progressing through it consistently. And the adaptations recommended by adaptive training have been good. He says, uh, however, uh, after missing two workouts and only, only completing two of the three of another one during a week long, nasty cold, a few weeks ago, uh, he says, Oh, I just lost my spot. I'm healthy again and completing the workouts and on with only moderate or easy RPE as such, I've ignored the suggested adaptations to my training plan. <laughs> Red flag Ivy, right? Uh, Ivy deals <laughs> yeah. with these, uh, with people asking these sort of questions on the forum all the time. <laughs> Uh, so he says that I've ignored the adaptations of the plan and continuing as originally proposed. I guess I'll know how it plays out in the end. If I can complete the workouts, I did, however, want to check in with you all and make sure I wasn't letting my ego get in the way of more effective training as I tend to be just, and he says in quotes, just work harder kind of guy as many cyclists are. Maybe I can get the same results by following adaptive training's recommendations and easier workouts, um, in line with Chad's minimum effective dose rationale rather than just pushing so hard that my progression or pushing harder, just so my progression levels are higher and stroking my ego. Hmm. So, yeah. uh, this is, I can uh, do this. and Ivy too. I want <laughs> Ivy to actually, can Ivy jump in first and then you, Nate, is that cool? Uh, I want to say the, the company line and I'll see what Ivy says. Okay. But the, sounds good. <laughs> so it, it, you failed those workouts. You're sick. It's going to drop you back. And then if you were to mark them with those RPs, you're saying it's going to jump you right back up really quickly. But at least we know that you're, mm, we, we will know that you are uh, capable of doing that and you're not going to put yourself in a hole. And that's the most important thing. And if you did jump ahead and you did them and they're not, the RP is not too hard, good for you. But that is, there's not many cases where you fail a workout and we're like, yeah, but really you can do more. Um, and I think that is a trap that, like I said, at the beginning, this is, this, this is a theme of this podcast. We can all fall into is like, that was just a bad day. I'll just, you know, I 200 pound squat crush me, but I think I can do 250 next week. Let's just try it. Um, <laughs> it's okay to come back down to 185, 175, and then move back up. Uh, especially if that one feels easy. So that that's what, yeah, that's my line. Go ahead, Ivy. Okay. Um, Brandon's statement of adaptive training has been suggesting lower level workouts, even though I'm healthy again and completing the workouts with only moderate or easy RPE as such, I have ignored the suggested adaptations to my plan. Please stop. Please don't do that. <laughs> There's a reason that your workouts feel moderate or easy. Um, it's supposed to adaptive training knows, and, and we here all know that you need to ease back into training, um, mm -hmm. especially after injury and illness and it's 
you know, we say trust the program and trust it after training. And I know how hard that is for our athletes to just blindly trust that it's, that it knows what it's doing. And it's hard when we give our athletes so many tools to reverse engineer adaptive training and to <laughs> change their plan. And it's so easy for our athletes to do that and make these changes because we enable them to, because we, we know that most of our athletes also know themselves and like life gets in the way and they need to make changes. And so we empower them to do so, but this is one of those circumstances where, you know, we allow you to do that. And then you know, down the road, you're like, is AT working for me? Mm, I think it's broken. And well, you, um, you ignored AT and did your own thing, you know? So I know, (laughs) I know it's, you know, it's so hard to trust the program, but not every workout is supposed to push you to your limit, especially when you're coming back from injury or illness. And that's why we have time off annotations where you can say that you're sick and injured and why we allow adaptations to take place after you skip workouts. It's meant to do this. Try to just mm-hmm. let yourself ease back into training and going hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, w- I would say, I'm, so what I always said too, is so, so common where someone, especially on our forum says it, blah, 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 blah. We talk to them. We look at their account. They have not followed it or they did just did like six <laughs> weeks of like a camp and they come back. They're like, I don't know why I can't do this. It's very frustrating for us to see that. Um, uh, but side note on this, in this case too, I would not say it's supposed to be easy or moderate, What adaptive training is trying to figure out where are you right now? Because we don't know if you are totally recovered yet, or if, uh, there could be other things going on in life. It could be stress, but that point to step back is you're still getting a workout. That's uh, some people think, you know, if I go from a four to a three, I'm not getting a workout. You're still getting a great workout and then we'll push you back up quickly. And that little mm-hmm. step back probably too, from being sick is going to be a improvement in the future. And the theme of this podcast, so many people want to ride that edge. And then when they, they fall off the edge, they're like, Oh, why didn't it work? Um, don't ride the edge, come back a little bit. And that's what we're doing inside of here. I think that's a been good a- way to, th- oh. Oh, just a good way to think about this is it's not just about coming back as fast as possible, but think about what you're kind of, if you think about it, of like how quickly can you ratchet up your level again after getting sick and coming and just the energy that your body had to put into healing whatever infection that was was a lot and so your legs might feel good but your body is still trying to recharge after a huge energy expenditure that had nothing to do with your training so like ivy said those first workouts might feel easier than what you would normally expect a workout to feel like. But if you allow that to happen for maybe one or two workouts, you respond honestly on the survey after those workouts, then that taking two days that feel easier than you think they should feel might allow you to get further even in a week than you would have if you Mm -hmm. had just pushed straight back to a higher level. So allow, allow a little bit of buffer in there and allow your body that opportunity to not just get back to a a place of absence of illness, but allow that energy to fully recharge before you get back. It's kind of like taking a step back to get a running start, like instead of just continue to walk ahead, um, give us that opportunity and give, give adaptive training that opportunity because just because, uh, because we do listen to those, those surveys, it does account for that. And we will ramp you up appropriately. Um, and it might ramp up faster if you give yourself just one or two more days of recovery. If I can just add a quick testimonial to this really quick, Nate, and then uh, jump into whatever you were going to say, but last year I had the highest FTP I've ever had. And I tied my highest watt KG I've ever had. And all of that, I am absolutely sure was because I was doing what Amber just said. I was not training at my limit all the time. And instead I was training within the appropriate bandwidth, right? Like that appropriate intensity range that appropriate everything. And as a result, my training was able to compound and build over time rather than me just flattening out. I had a tendency to want to push myself way too hard and not follow a plan. And then with adaptive training, I was like, I need to follow the plan. I need to follow the system. So then it can really tell me what to do. And I had my best performances as a result of that. And it, it did not feel, there were many times where I was like, man, I wonder if I'm training hard enough. I don't feel completely smashed after this workout. And I don't feel completely smashed after the next one. And fast forward a few months, I'm faster than I have been. And it's, 
It's just, we're not very wise. We think very short term, personally speaking, us type A driven athletes, we think very short term and we don't understand things that are much further down the way. And that's one of the benefits of adaptive training is it's looking at data on a much larger scale than what we consider with our minds. That's why it works. So yeah, no, that, it's hard to do that. That step back that Amber talked about, uh, I think what we can think of cyclists is that, oh, this isn't, now I've lost fitness. I love the weight training analogy because I think for those who do weight train, it, it makes a lot more sense. Let's say 200, 200 pounds squat. You try to do 10 or 150 or whatever it is. I'll just use 200 for easy math. Um, you couldn't do eight and you're trying to do, you're trying to do eight. You can only do three. And next week you do 180 and you do it for 12 and then, okay, now I'm going to go back up, but you don't look at that 180 and be like, oh, now I'm weak. Now I can't get any, like, this is going to do nothing. It actually does do a lot of uh, stuff. It's just a small reduction and you're still getting stronger, like you're, you're maintaining fitness. And then you're a little bit more fresh. And the next time you go up, up a little bit more, it's that the reduction that it will do is not the end of the world. And as Amber said too, you can actually go up faster um, depending on how it feels. And if it doesn't, if it still feels hard, that reduction was very, very appropriate then. And you can step back in. I've, when I get sick for a week, I actually have to go back. I, I step back no matter what. I've never been sick for a week and then been able to continue my training plan. Uh, mm -hmm. Like in the same progression, I have to step back just the way it is and then move forward. And it, it does take a, a week to get back, but that's, I mean, that's the most common thing for everyone is when you get sick, you get a little less fit and you got to work back into it. Uh, that's just the way it is. So everyone has the same playing field. Yeah. Uh, trust the process. That's what I would say. Keep it going. Trust the process. Okay. Matt's question is super short. I just want to cover this because I heard a great thing that's helped me change my perspective on this. He says, love the podcast listening for several years. I've recently run into hip flexor tightness. I'm thinking that he says, I'm thinking I need to raise the bars to change my closed hip angle, but I'm wondering how cleat position and seat position should be edited to help relieve this also. I've been targeting long ultra mountain bike and gravel races this year, and it will be your six Leadville. Wow. Way to go, Matt. Six Leadville. That's a uh, pretty, right that's, on. that's a lot of times up power line <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that darn climb, uh, and says, uh, and been trying to break nine hours. Best is nine Oh six lowered the front end last year on the steer tube uh, to be more arrow. But if this problem persists with my tight hip flexors, the arrow gain will be negated with dysfunction. I agree with that. So planning a shop fit, but would love your input, especially Nate as he's taller, but I think I'm similar proportions. Uh, Nate, do you want to give any input on this before I just share the one thing that I wanted to share with this one? No, go for it. Okay. Uh, so we say hip flexor tightness, but I want to call it hip flexor dysfunction or even weakness or lack of mobility. It, uh, Dr. Kelly Sturette, we've done an episode uh, with, uh, with him. Let's look that one up uh, at the ready state. He's fantastic and a great leader on, on mobility. And cyclists get very weak hip flexors. And as a result, when they get weak, because everyone has short hip flexors, first of all, these days, we all sit a bunch. We're not like we aren't walking around and hunting our own food as like hunter gatherers these days. <laughs> and that's like not our whole day. Instead, we're sitting down, our hip flexors get short. Everybody has tight hip flexors. The problem is that we have dysfunctional hip flexors because we, they get neglected in the pedal stroke. A lot of the time they aren't used, uh, strength training. We talk about this all the time, working on lateral movements, working on a bunch of different movements that you can do and just moving and being active instead of just sitting down and riding your bike makes a huge difference. So a lot of people say, oh, your hip flexors are really tight. I've gone to countless PTs and like, man, they're really tight. And it's like, yeah, well, yours are tight too. And so is everybody else's like, they're all tight. What the problem is, is that our body can't use them effectively. And that's what we get from strength training. It's just a great thing to do. So Matt, I think you're on the right track for going and getting a fit and that's awesome. But a perspective shift, everybody has tight hip flexors. Instead, think about the strength training that you can do to be able to enable your hips to work a little bit better. And I bet that you'll see a whole lot of alleviation just in that. And so. I'm going on a side note now on this, Matt, if you are tall, like me, or you have longer legs and a very high seat post relative to your size bike, um, it, it can be, you, what will happen is you'll have a very, a lot of stack underneath your, uh, your stem, a lot of spacers, and you have the opportunity to go really low, right? It's like, there's, it's like a temptation, uh, that there's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, there's this much, uh, I don't know, three inches of, of spacers that I want to take out. Cause you look at someone else 
who is more of the general population where bikes are made for like John, and he's got five millimeters, 10 millimeters or no. Right. And it looks really cool. It Pros look do cool. it. Looks Pro, great. I know. Yep. <laughs> These comments like that. Impact no, sorry, us sorry. Talking. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and there, and people go, wow, your large bike, extra large frame just doesn't look as cool. And mm -hmm. it can, we can think of, oh, we're not as tough because we can't go, we're not as low as other people, but we really just have more opportunity to go lower. Um, I remember I was, I think it was on my TT bike. I got fit and I had so much stack and I, it was a, uh, I think it was a retool system. And they were like, I was doing Ironmans and like, wow, your hip angle is for an aggressive 40 K T tier. And I couldn't go any <laughs> higher, like just because the bike size is this. And so if you looked at my bike, you're like, wow, this guy, he's going to be so comfortable all day. But then if you looked at actually the hip angle, you're like, this, this guy's crazy to do this in an Ironman. And I, and I got <laughs> performance issues. My neck would hurt. I could not stay an arrow. And on Leadville is so long. That would be the one race mm. where I would actually go higher than lower. Um, unless you were going to pick up your front wheel on the climbs. Uh, if you're around nine hours, there's going to be people um, on those, on those things. It's much better to just sit behind somebody, be more comfortable. You know, Matt, like Leadville is attrition, like comfort, get the arrow helmet, get the skin suit and uh, work and sit behind people. And I would not be concerned one bit with getting super low, um, especially if it's going to lower your power, it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to lower your power. Like, I, I don't like your idea at all, Matt. <laughs> uh, I just want to bring this back to a more relative point for people that aren't doing level and riding mountain bikes and specifically bring up, we posted on Instagram, uh, uh, infographic, uh, geez, I guess about a month ago or so now, but it was about which is faster. And it was using best bike split data. It was about riding in the hoods, riding on the tops or riding in the drops. And it didn't cover the situation of riding in the hoods and then like having your forearms parallel which is cited by everybody. And this, sorry, I'm going to vent. It's a bit of a pet peeve. Everyone's like, well, it's faster to ride in the hoods with my arms parallel. It's only faster if you're low in that position and holding that position and being low for a long time is really hard. That's why like Pete always mentioned that he put himself in a different position on his bike to be able to even hold that. So if like you can have a really low position and you can change everything around, but if you can't sustain that position, it's probably not aerodynamic and it's almost certainly not sustainable and comfortable and allowing you to put out the power that you should, you know, as soon as you get down you drop your forearms down low and you're holding on top of the hoods like that and see how long you can hold that position comfortably. It's not that long. It's a lot harder to hold than it seems. And that's the only way that that position gets, you know, significantly, I guess, uh, advantageous to just riding in the drops, riding in the drops makes us low, but anyways, Nate's point is very important. You need to do what's sustainable. And also Nate's drop is insane. I could probably do chin-ups on his saddle when it's at full extension. So, uh, and that's just, and you can't raise your bars high enough, honestly, to get even, no. it wouldn't be possible. They don't make no, it even would be enough. crazy, but two, our right? arms are longer Two is taller people. So that has to take into account also. Yeah. But generally higher usually feels pretty good. Your back angle is pretty flat, man. <laughs> like, like it's just the way it is. Like it has to be, you know, it's crazy. This is a good point about where we default to as cyclists when something is wrong and we try to find, like, think it's a symptom of a bike fit or, or something else that it's, it's not, um, it's like a physiological dysfunction, but it's as you know, cyclists were like, my knees hurt. I got to fix my cleats or, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, that's rarely ever the cause. Right. Yeah. I changed my cleats a lot for like four years trying to figure out my knee issues. Never, never fixed it. So, um, okay. Last question from Zach it says, Hey there team, uh, love tuning in live or otherwise each week. My question may be a painful one because it has to do with inconsistent training. Once again, it's as if we planned a theme this week, uh, it says I completed my low volume, sweet spot base one and sweet spot base two twice because I felt I wasn't ready for the build phase. Awesome. Good to hear. Uh, more base isn't a bad thing. I started lifting a lot and was totally new to that. So my focus was resting there. I've now completed short power build and I felt I did really well with the weekday VO2 work. But as the weather got warmer and group rides and races started up, I found myself completing maybe half of the structured threshold and sweet spot weekend workouts. The races were hard <laughs> and were just, I don't know if you yawned 
almost sneezed or bit your finger because you were cringing for him. Um, it, was, it was a yawn. <laughs> okay, <Sorry>. good. <laughs> Got it. Uh, the races were hard but short, and the group rides are usually at least three hours long and average low sweet spot numbers. Ooh, that's a big trap. Uh, averaging mm -hmm. whatever you averaged during the ride doesn't necessarily, unless you did like a perfectly paced TT, doesn't represent the work that was done during it. Mm -hmm. So big caveat there. Yes. Okay. So the question that we have from Zach is how much am I compromising my progression by only doing structured VO2 and really skimping on the structured threshold and sweet spot? Thanks for all you do. Yeah, Zach, this happens to everybody during race season. We're talking about like building for training and then racing through and like, cause that's what you're training for, right? Is to race. You're probably not training to train and that VO2 work, you can still raise that progression and a lot of times races, you might, you probably will get a more, a bigger fitness increase by actually doing like structured work and trainer workouts and stuff, but like group rides and races, these are fun. And this is why you do it. And there's a balance. I mean, Amber probably had this, right? You, you had your off season where you build fitness and then it's, how do I maintain this fitness for a long time? And how do I, how do I build this week so that I can perform in these races? Uh, so I wouldn't say necessary. It's a, it's a bad thing. It really depends on the races, but like for a two hour workout, I mean, if I did two, two and a half hours of either threshold, not threshold together, but intervals or sweet spot, <laughs> that is, if I'm racing correctly, that's almost always a better, uh, fitness outcome than on those three hour races, man, that, that is like, I just sit in, I don't really do much stuff and I Punch. stay really low. It's easy. And then I do a lot of work at once. And then I kind of, you know, it, it's not, it's really, really easy for 80% of the race usually because I'm racing, right? You can't be hard for all 90 and it's not going to be very consistent where you're like, okay, everyone's going to go threshold for 20 minutes and now stop I'm threshold for 20 minutes. Um, I don't know. That's the way it is. Amber and I, but you both have this, right? Especially in cross the having to maintain fitness in a season where you're racing a ton. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, I, I can't figure it out and that's why I don't, I don't <laughs> like try to <laughs> coach myself. So yeah. yeah, it's one thing that I want to add with this really quick is the whole point of training is to be able to give yourself a specific type and amount of stress. So then your body adapts to that in a specific way. Like that's the, that's the point. Right. And when you race, you don't get to choose what that is. You can't say, guys, I really need to see my progression levels go up on my sweet spot by this. So let's ride like this today. <laughs> like it doesn't work. So as a result, a race, uh, while you may get, uh, you know, you may be working on repeatability and improving that in a race, you may be, there may be some things that do improve. Absolutely. Uh, not to mention all of the other things, the soft skills, like Ivy mentioned that are super important with racing that you learn when you race, but there is a detriment. If you're skipping all of your steady state work that you're doing, that sweet spot work, that aerobic work that you're trying to work on, then eventually you will find yourself plateauing. Right. And that's why training is periodized where you work on your base and then you build on top of that. Then you specialize where you get very specific and then it resets and you go back into retouching on that aerobic conditioning, because it's, it's really important to be able to spend time doing that. That said, I just want to double down on what Nate said. This is the whole point of why you trained, right? Zach is to race and to do these things. So if you're in your specialty phase, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I would advocate for not skipping the sweet spot work. If you can, it plays really, it pays huge dividends in race performance. Um, it, it's a very race specific zone in many cases for a lot of athletes and different types of things they do. So spend time doing that. Uh, if you can, if you're going to toss one out, maybe toss one out, that's going to be a bit more replicated by your race efforts, uh, then, or maybe just drop down in volume. And then that way you aren't skipping workouts. You're hitting all your workouts and then you're still able to do all of your group rides or races and still be able to maintain. Yeah. The good think, news yeah. is, Oh, Oh, go ahead. The good news is soon, uh, train road will account for all that stuff, all of your mm -hmm. outside unstructured rides, your group rides, and well, adjust your future I, workouts. Again. I don't know how soon soon is, but we are validating <laughs> our thing. So it's, it's software, the number one so focus. Not sure. Yeah. Cause if you say soon Ivy, they will yeah. come for us. Oh, in the forum. That could mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I said in the forum, uh, for another feature, I said up to as soon as one month or more. Right. That's when, <laughs> that's when another yeah. feature yeah. will be released. <laughs> not it's this true. one, but yeah. that's the, 
Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. And it's Amber. not because we're trying to fool anybody. Sorry. One, it's not because yeah. we're trying to like fool or pull the wall over anybody. Right. Nate, it's mm-hmm. just because these things are dynamic and it's hard to yeah, put so like a hard timeline on them. What you're talking about is workout levels B2 for the outside stuff to be able to score outside rise to, to figure out what the actual fitness is and affect your progression levels. And what we're, so we have the, uh, the, the, the thing done to score these that we think is correct. And that ability is all done. And now what we're doing is we're looking back in the history of, uh, I'm not sure if it's all riders, but a, a very number of riders to see, to score their outside rides and then see what they do for inside rides to make sure to validate it. Like, so we're building that part right there because if we, we have to make sure that's correct, that we have to validate before it comes out. Cause if it's not correct, that'll be very, very bad. Uh, so we'll be able to look at a bunch of data, a bunch of rides, um, most likely millions and millions of rides to do this, to see if you score this outside and then you have the right amount of rest, how do you do in the future? So we don't want to do is John does a, gets a scores, a level eight threshold outside. And the next week he scores a four inside and he goes, that was like, or he couldn't do it. Like that was all out. There's too big of a gap there. And obviously there's, there's something going on there that we're not aware of. And we don't think that's going to happen, but we have to validate it before we put it out there. So that's the phase. And that's a lot of data engineering and stuff to be able to do that at scale. And that's where we're at. So the soon, if it's exactly how we want it, soon might be soon. If it's, uh, if we have to make tweaks, then it won't be soon. And there, there's a bunch of other stuff going on. That's, that's complicated that I don't want to mention until it actually gets released, but to account for different things, which is very big. I understand. Mm-hmm. Sorry. <laughs> Good job censoring yourself, Nate. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Amber, we interrupted you. I apologize. No, 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 that's fine. That was a good aside. Um, I just want to step back for a second. And, um, if you're not completing those threshold sweet spot workouts because you're replacing them with fun group rides and races, that's one thing. If you're not completing them because you're actually struggling with them, then let's step back and think about what what's happening with adding in those group rides and those races. What you want to do is you want, you want to add in group rides and races that enhance your training. And by enhance, I mean, they make it fun. Um, they help your motivation and they're actually helping you be more consistent over the long term because it's really something that's engaging you and enhancing your experience on the bike. Enhancing is different from additive, just adding more isn't necessarily going to enhance your experience. And sometimes it can actually detract from it because you might be doing too much, not recovering enough and digging yourself into a hole. So I just ask you to take a quick check, be honest with yourself. Um, is a lack of completion just because you're replacing these workouts and overall you're feeling great and having a lot of fun. Awesome. Keep doing that. If you are struggling to complete those workouts because you're adding in many, maybe too many group rides and races that's increasing the overall level of intensity and stress of your training. And you're not offsetting that with better or more recovery, then let's take a step back and check that out. Make sure you get that in a good place, um, before you, you know, before you're adding stuff on. So difference between adding things and enhancing things. I've also had it where so race a lot, uh, Zach, if you're not happy with your performance in those. I've totally been like, okay, I'm going to skip these three weeks and I'm just going to train for this. I'm just going to do structured training these three weeks. I'm going to skip my group rides or my races and have a little recovery and then come back in because it can be frustrating when group rides or races, when you're on the, like you're always on the back foot and it's really hard and you come, you train a little bit more, you gain five Watts or you you improve an energy system, like anaerobic that might really benefit in some of these races. I don't know if you're doing long climbs or you're doing really punchy stuff. And you come back and the rate, it's so much more fun. You're like more mid pack or you're the front of the pack and totally, uh, dude, that's an option. Some people think that they can't skip that or they have to do this sort of thing. You can totally take a step back, focus on training and then come back and have more fun. How many times have all of us done that skipped races or group rides because we want to prioritize training <laughs> countless yeah. for me. Ivy goes yeah. never. No, I do. And I hate it. I get so sad. Yeah. Oh, well, you love the, I do totally love it. Yeah. It's my favorite how part many, of riding bikes. How many times do you race a year? Ooh, um, uh, yo, a lot. Um, <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> with cross specifically, all of those UCI weekends are two races. And then, um, depending on where I am between the races, I might, if there's like a weekday pickup race, I'll do those too. And then all of the 
road and XC stuff that I do for training for that it can really add up. Um, 30. Um, I think the most I did when, oh, and like when I was doing track and stuff too, yikes. I think I did a between like 40 and 50 race day year, a couple years in a row. Wow. That's wow. a lot. There's 15 yeah, a lot. weeks in a year. That's a lot. And so <laughs> when you do that amount of races, how much does your fitness increase versus when you're just in like training phase? Um, Hmm. That's hard to measure. Uh, cause race performance could increase with tactics yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. We'll look back at your career and get back to everybody. Cause we'll be able to look <laughs> at it. Yeah. Sorry. It's hard for me to say. Um, and you know, yeah. it's specifically hard to say with how much I was gaining during those like base training phases and throwing in a race a week. That's just for training and not like really trying to give her and perform well, just to use it to supplement training. How am I gauging my performance and how much I'm improving versus when I'm really racing and really trying to get the most out of my performance. And I can see visibly my gains that I'm making, yeah. you know, we'll be able to measure just, that and we can report back. Yeah. Right. Cause that's like the whole that. point of what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I just had Thanks. like, uh, Oh no, I'm sorry. I just had, um, like horrible flashbacks of being in the Pacific Northwest and doing track like two days a week. And then there's weekday crit and then two races, like a road race and a crit on a weekend and how hard it was. Oh. And thinking just like not even training ever during the week, you just, you go race like four days a week. It was so hard, but so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks everybody. This has been an awesome, awesome episode. Hopefully what we've been able to grasp from it is the importance of consistency and then how to maintain that. And in addition to that, gotten some good actionable tips on how to race better too. Uh, it's been fun. Good stuff. If you're listening to this now, rate the podcast five stars on iTunes and on Spotify, Spotify would be huge. Please do that. That's a big one for us because that's where more and more people are getting their podcasts. And currently I'm checking right now, but I don't think that we're the leading one. I got to see. Uh, also, if you're listening to this and you haven't gone to trainer road to be able to give it a shot, trainerroad.com, try it out, see if it makes you faster. We're pretty darn confident that it will. So we have, I think, Oh, we're getting close to number one. We still need, I think it's 400 people. So oh. if uh, we have way more than that, listening to this podcast right now, many, many, many more go to Spotify, rate it five stars. It'd be fantastic. And then we'll be number one next week. What should we do to celebrate for being number one? Beers of Chad. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. That might be a little much. Uh, we'll think of something. It'll be good. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you all next week. Take care.